All right. I'm excited to bring this next gentleman up. Uh, he's been a guest on the show multiple times. He's a wonderful, wonderful priest. Father John is a priest in the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia, Rokor. He's head priest at St. Jonah Orthodox Church in Spring, Texas, wonderful parish that I've had the honor of attending several times. He's a former Nazarene associate pastor who in November of 1990, converted to the Orthodox faith soon after completing his BA in theology at Southern Nazarene University in Oklahoma. Father John is the author of Solo Scriptura, an Orthodox analysis of the cornerstone of Reformation theology and the general editor of the St. Innocent Liturgical Calendar. You can read his writings at his blog titled, uh, I think it's just Father John at Blogspot, if I remember, and it's a very, very good blog. For anyone who's a new convert like myself, you can just go to his blog and, and, the, and type in a search bar kind of what topic you're looking for, and it's almost always there in my personal experience. So without further ado, Father John, welcome up. Well, I want to thank you all for coming. The topic or the title of my talk is Southern Agrarianism in Moldova. And uh, before the end of it, I'll get to Moldova and also talk about why that matters to the topic of, the conf of uh, this conference. But I want to say a few things about the fellowship and why we established it. And that's because there are things in Southern culture that are good, true, and beautiful. And they can help us to lead people to the Orthodox faith and it also can help people to be better Christians and to raise their families in the Christian faith. And this doesn't mean that we think that Southern culture is superior to every other culture on the face of the globe. It just means that this is our culture. If, if we were having this conference in China, there are things that we could talk about Chinese culture that would not be the same as what we're talking about here, but there are things that can be used in that culture to connect people with orthodoxy. But we're here and we wanna lead people to the Orthodox faith. And uh, Southern culture is, of course, like any other culture, not perfect. And there are things that are worth keeping and there are things that are not. Uh, you know, the, the analogy of a rose with thorns is true of most uh, cultures. You, you wanna appreciate the rose, but you, you don't wanna prick your fingers on the thorns. A lot of times when we talk about the South and Southern culture, the immediate knee-jerk reaction we encounter today is, well, that's racist. And Southern culture is not a race. Southern culture is, of course, associated with the white population in the South, which has been the majority population, but it's certainly not limited to that. As a matter of fact, I worked for the state of Texas for about 27 years, first with the Welfare Department, then later with the Child Support Division. And during my time with the state of Texas, most of my coworkers were black females. And I think more often than not, my supervisor was a black female. And uh, what I found with my, my coworkers that fit that demographic description was that they were deeply religious people with almost no exceptions. They were all church going people. And what I found was I could talk to them about cultural and religious things in a way that I couldn't often talk to a lot of my white coworkers who were much more liberal than, than they were. As a matter of fact, when I was in training to be uh, for my first job with the state of Texas, I was part of a group that I think had about eight black women, one black man, uh, one Hispanic man, two white liberal women and myself. And one day we were having lunch together and the topic of abortion somehow came up and it was me and the eight black women against the two white liberal women <laughs> with the black man and the Hispanic man not having anything to say because they didn't want to get caught up in all that. Um, and so my, when I think of the piety in Southern culture, that's often the first thing that comes to my mind because I've mostly lived in the cities where you don't encounter as much the traditional uh, culture that you would encounter if you lived in, in rural 
parts of the South, even among the white population. But in the city white population, for, particularly in Houston, one thing you find is that a lot of them are not even from the South. And of course, a lot of them have lost their roots. So it's a little bit different when you're talking about the urban environment than the rural. But a lot of these people that I work with came from more rural areas and they all grew up in church. And church was, was still the most important thing to them. But also part of Southern culture is the American Indian population, believe it or not. If you look at Oklahoma was actually part of the, the Southern Confederacy and the last general to surrender was a Cherokee Indian, Stan Wadey. And uh, you, we also have Hispanics in the South, and we always have. We, we've also got a French population in Louisiana, and then there's also people who are various combinations of all the aforementioned, and that's always been part of the South. And so when we talk about Southern culture, it includes all those things, and of course there are differences between different parts of the South. But when you're talking about some generalities, there are things that they all have in common. Now, the way I got interested in Southern agrarianism is a little bit of a, of a meandering story, but to tell you a little bit about my background, my mother was from Chicago, and so most of her family were from the northern part of the country. And uh, my father was born in Texas, and most of his family was from the south. There were some cross-pollinations in both families. As a matter of fact, on my mother's side, going up the maternal line, my great-grandmother, who I got to know, she died, I think, when I was about 13 or 14 years old, was actually born in rural Arkansas, even though she had moved to Chicago. So, so there was some Southern influence even there. But So that background gave me a little bit of a broader perspective than maybe than the average person, because I could see it from both sides. I would hear things from both sides of the family and see differences between the both sides of the family. I was raised... Uh, in a very conservatively religious home. And uh, also politically, I was, would be what you probably would call a neoconservative, you know, basically mainstream Republican Party cheering on America's wars and thinking that America was right and not really seeing anything wrong with that until I became an Orthodox Christian. And it didn't happen overnight when I became an Orthodox Christian, but as an Orthodox Christian, I began to see things that didn't jive with the mainstream narrative. Um, I actually enlisted in the Marine Corps right at the, the same week that I was baptized as an Orthodox Christian, I was enlist, I enlisted in the Marine Corps. It's a long story. I actually didn't go back to duty because I got injured, answered prayer, yeah, a long story. But, but, uh, but I enlisted right before the first Gulf War, and I bought all the propaganda that the Iraqis were taking babies out of incubators in Kuwait City and throwing them on the floor and all that kind of stuff. And I thought America was in the right and I was ready to go fight and possibly die in that war. Um, but after I became an Orthodox Christian, I started seeing the results of our wars from an Orthodox perspective. I started to see things like the decimation of the Christian population of Iraq after we invaded later under Bush Jr. And uh, that 10 percent of the Iraqi population was Christian before he went in there, and there's very little bit, there's very little of it left now. And we did that. And at first I thought, well, maybe that was just an oversight. Maybe, maybe our, uh, to, uh, the, 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 the geniuses we have in Washington, D.C. just weren't aware of all this stuff and the results that would happen when they stepped in there and removed a strong man who certainly had his his issues, but I don't think anybody looking at what happened to Iraq after the fact would say that Saddam Hussein was such a bad guy after all. A lot of people wish that they could go back to the period of time when Saddam Hussein was the president of Iraq because Iraq was a peaceful country and there were 10% of the population was Christian and they were able to function without fear. And quite a few people in his cabinet were Christians. And all that's gone, thanks to us. And then I saw what we did when we bombed the, the, the Serbs in, in, in uh, Bosnia, when we bombed the Serbs throughout what was Yugoslavia, when we armed and helped the Croatians to ethnically cleanse the Kraina region of Croatia, which Kraina, by the way, it, it is a variation of the same word in Slavic, Ukraine. It was the border region of Croatia. We had no problem with Croatia kicking out the majority Serbian population from that area. And most of those people have never returned. 
And so if I had not been an Orthodox Christian, I wouldn't be paying attention to some of these kinds of things. But because I was an Orthodox Christian, I started, I started to see, hey, wait a minute, there, there's something wrong here. And then more recently, our policy in Syria, where again, we have a country that was 10% Christian, we enable ISIS to go in there and start destroying historic monasteries. We, don't, we have no idea the historic loss that occurred because we enabled ISIS. It wasn't an accident. You know, when you have uh, an army that moves across the desert where there's no foliage to hide them, and, and the United States supposedly is fighting an air war against these terrorists, and yet they're able to move across open desert for, for tens and hundreds of miles and, and nothing happens to them, that was not an accident. And these monasteries, in many cases, had manuscripts that we have no idea what were, was in there. And there are things that, had we been able to access them before these uh, jihadists destroyed them, who knows what we might have learned about our own history. But all that's been destroyed. And we continue to occupy uh, more than 10% of, of Syria and to take their oil. And we're occupying the most fertile region of Syria, so we're not allowing them to access their food and we are trying to starve the population of Syria to impose our will because we don't like their leader. Well, as an Orthodox Christian, I know a lot of people from Syria. And when you talk to Christians from Syria, I've yet to meet a single one that said, Assad needs to go. And why do, you know, Assad's not a perfect guy. He's certainly not you know, a, a liberal Democrat, like you know, in, the, in the broad sense of that term. But Assad comes from a Muslim minority group the Alawites, and, and as a minority group in Syria, he has an interest in protecting the Christian minority because the more minority groups there are in Syria that are protected, the more his minority group is protected. And so he's protected the Christians, whereas if we have the jihadists that the United States government has been trying to put in power take over that country, you can kiss the Christian population of Syria goodbye. And, uh, and those of you that are Antiochians, that's where your patriarch lives, is right there in Damascus. So you could see one of the four ancient patriarchates be eradicated in our lifetime because of American foreign policy. So all these things caused me to start to question things. But then I came across on YouTube doing some historical research, uh, Dr. Livingston, who was our previous speaker. And I began to listen to him and other uh, similar scholars lecture on these topics and began to read Southern agrarian writers and to hear what they had to say. And what I learned was is that what I thought was the American way was not the only American way. What is the American way as it's normally protected or, or, or uh, depicted? It's a crusade for democracy. We're gonna impose our democracy. We want everyone to be like us. If you saw the movie, movie Full Metal Jacket, which I've ever, never actually watched, and from what I understand, I wouldn't recommend you watch, but if you have watched it, there's a line in the movie where some American officer, and I'll clean up the quote uh, a bit, but he said, inside of every Vietnamese person, that's the part I'm cleaning up, inside of every Vietnamese person is an American dying to get out. That, that's been the American attitude. Inside of every Afghanist, a, Afghani, there's an American dying to get out. We just need to go over there and let those Americans free, and they'll be exactly like us. Well, we come to find out not everybody wants to be an American. America, the American way has been if it can be done, we should do it. That, and there's good aspects of this. You know, we put a man on the moon. That's a great achievement for the human race. But some things maybe we ought to not do. Maybe there are some things that would have been best if we had not opened that Pandora's box. There's also this idea of infinite progress, that we can always get richer, we can always uh, get better. We, we, you know, we're, we're always uh, moving towards this sort of Star Trek utopia where religion ceases to be, nobody gets paid, but everybody works because they want to do the right thing. And, uh, and we have infinite progress, and, it, and in the Star Trek universe, all of mankind is united. There's no differences between uh, different countries. They're all the same. That's, that's sort of the American idea. And there's also this idea of rugged individualism. And uh, you, you, to use a more technical phrase, self-actualization. My goal is to be the best that I can be and not really consider 
whether that's the best thing for my family, whether that's the best thing for my community, but it's really focused on what can I do? And uh, unfortunately, what that's led to is a sense of rootlessness in our culture, which has also led to loneliness and isolation and outright mental illness. And you see that all over our society. And it also has led to hedonism, where people just do what they want to do and they, they feel like it's okay. And because the way we've been told democracy is supposed to work, we're all supposed to say that that's okay. But if you look at where that has gotten us, I would say the results have not been good. My, my father was born in 1925, and he was part of that greatest generation that fought in World War II. When you think about that generation that fought in World War II, most of those people grew up on farms like my father did. And, uh, and they had a different kind of character than the average American has today. And I would say that the character has not improved. But I would say the other American way that I discovered when I started reading these Southern agrarian writers is the Southern tradition. For one thing, when it comes to foreign policy, the Southern way is to mind your own business unless it affects you directly. And we, we, we the Southern, not, not to say all Southerners have been this way, there have been imperialistic Southerners too, but just to give you one example, when the Mexican-American War was on the horizon, John C. Calhoun, who was uh, at one time the president, vice president of the United States, but one of the great Southern politicians before the Civil War, he spoke out vehemently against the invasion of Mexico. For one thing, he said, if we, if we allow an American president to go and provocatively send troops to a border region that's under dispute and create a military incident so that we can get into a war and then say, oh, the flag's been fired on, so we have to declare war, we're never going to see the end of war. Well, that's if prophet, more prophetic words have never been spoken because that's the history of the United States in almost every war thereafter is that we provoke an incident and then go to war and say, oh, we've been fired upon and it's all okay. And there's a great quote, and I, I didn't uh, write it down, but you can look it up. But he talked about how, for one thing, we, ought, we, we could negotiate with Mexico about this. This, this incident that, that happened was not a justification for a full-scale invasion. And we ought not want to humble our sister republic, Mexico, and that the future of America is linked to the future of Mexico. We ought want to see Mexico prosper. And... What's been, the, what's been the result of us not being concerned about the prosperity of Mexico? Well, we've had a lot of bad things uh, coming across that border as a result of that. So we should have listened to what he had to say. One thing about the Southern tradition is, is that we take tradition seriously. And before we tear a fence down, we want to find out why the fence was there in the first place and to consider what the consequences of it are going to be. And there's, the Southern tradition is to try to balance material comfort and progress with family and community and to not push things to the ultimate limit, but to try to maintain cohesion in, in, in your community. And there's definitely a, a value that we place upon faith, tradition, and our history. And Dr. Livingston talked about that great, a great deal. But basically what the Southern agrarians were warning against in the 1930s was is that the good things in the South that are still there could all be gone. Because if we go down the industrialization route that the new South politicians, which was a progressive movement, by the way, and that's where Jim Crow came from, by the way, what the, 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 the pre-Civil War people, the people who lived before the Civil War that became politicians after the Civil War were opposed to Jim Crow laws. It was the new South movement that said, hey, the North has these Jim Crow laws because that's where they began. And we should be like them. We, you know, if you can't beat them, join them. That's basically what the, the New South is all about. They're industrial, we should be industrial. We should do like they're doing, chase the dollar and, and get rich and everybody will be happy. Well, you know, there's a good side to that, you could say, and that's that if you have industrialization, lots of people get work, there's material uh, progress that's made, but there's a lot that is lost. And when you can think about the warnings that the agrarians had, you have to say that a lot of what they predicted has already happened, but there's still some of what they were talking about is good in the South that still exists, and that's what we need to try to uh, tap into. A society is, is not just judged by its gross domestic product or the technology that it has. I would say the main measure of a, a society is its human product. It's the ability to produce well-rounded human beings. 
and to promote virtue. Now, virtue is not going to get you into heaven, so don't think that that's what I'm trying to say, but I would say that if you live in a society that is values virtue and pursue, pursues virtue, it's a lot easier to live a Christian life. It's a lot easier to raise a Christian family. So I would say that that's something that we should be concerned about. And here's the Moldovan connection. You know, the, if you aren't aware of something when you see it, sometimes you won't see it. If, if you or an Eskimo, and you look at the snow that they see, they see different kinds of snow because that's the world that they live in. So they pay a lot of attention to subtleties. But if you took somebody from the equator and you put them up in, in Alaska and you said, what do you see? They just say, I see a bunch of snow. But the, Mex the, the Eskimos see things that that person from the equator doesn't see. Well, because I had read all this material, when I went to Moldova, I started seeing a lot of stuff. I got to go to Moldova because there's a family in my, in my parish, the wife is from Moldova. And she and her husband invited my wife and I to go on a trip there. And uh, I've always done, done all my globe trotting on other people's nickels, so I was more than happy to take up the opportunity to go see another country. Because I don't have a lot of money to be spending on that kind of stuff. And I thought, well, I'm you know, good. She was telling me there's lots of beautiful monasteries there. We'll go over the, the border to Romania. There's a lot to see there. And it all sounded good to me. But I really was not expecting to have it be a life-changing experience. But it really was. Because what I saw in Moldova was a largely agrarian Orthodox Christian country. And I got to see how they functioned. Here in the United States, if you go down to, to downtown Houston, you're gonna see street people. And when I worked for the state and I was walking from the parking lot to the courthouse a lot, when I worked for the attorney general's office, even dressed in civilian clothes, I'd have people coming up to me and asking for money. So I always carried loose change so I could give them something because I, as an Orthodox Christian, come, came to understand that almsgiving was something that we're supposed to do. And I try not to ever turn someone away by saying, because I don't have anything on me, so I try to keep money that I can give to people. Um, and when I visited Russia, which has been twice, I've had street people coming up to me and asking me for money. And there I was dressed as a priest, and so I think they particularly targeted me because I'm, in Russia, it's a legacy of the Soviet period, but priests typically don't wear clerical attire when they're in the street. And, uh, and so when people see a priest, and if you're a beggar, you immediately think, okay, here's someone who I can ask for some money, and he'll, he'll give it to me. Uh, Moldova is by far the poorest country that I've ever been in my life. And I kept thinking people were coming up and asking for money. It, it, this happened over and over again. And when it was translated what they were asking for, they wanted a blessing. There was only one person I think might have been actually asking for money, but in retrospect, as I thought about it, I'm wondering if I misinterpreted what he was asking. <laughs> and so I, I'm not sure that I encountered even one beggar in Moldova. And uh, as a matter of fact, I was at the airport at one point uh, during the trip because we had to go there to get some paperwork for the rental car to get it across the border to Romania, basically a, a vehicle passport. And uh, while I was standing out there, some guy came up to me and gave me 75 Mold Moldovan lei, which that's Moldovan, uh, a Moldovan lei is about five cents. So 75 times five cents, you can add that up. But uh, I thought he was going to ask for me for money. He gave me that money and then basically said he, he was wanting a blessing to, and for me to pray for him. Um, so here you have a country where you don't have street people. I didn't see any street people the whole time that I was there. You have people who have a strong sense of history. And if you go to Moldova, you'll see images of St. Stephen the Great all over the place, because St. Stephen the Grace was the greatest leader that Moldova ever had in its history, and he established quite a few of the monasteries that you'll see if you go there or into the part of Romania that is, uh, was once part of Moldova. And uh, they know their village history, they, their churches. The, the one thing about Moldova that you should understand is that because it became part of the Russian Empire about 300 years ago, roughly, there's a lot of Russian influence, but there are Romanian speaking people. Um, and so their architecture is Russian. The vestments of the priests wear are Russian. Their services are in Romanian. And uh, they have many unique, beautiful traditions. Um, but uh, 
They were spared the worst of the Soviet period because after World War I, Moldova was annexed into Romania because they considered Moldova to be what rightfully belongs to them. And I suppose they have a historical argument to make there, but the Moldovans do have some say in that matter. But they were annexed to Romania, so therefore the worst part of the Soviet period where they were the most destructive and they were uh, turning, you know, destroying churches right and left and rounding up priests and shooting them, they weren't there for that. So they missed out on all that. And then again, when the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union, the Romanians were allied with the Nazis. They retook Moldova and claimed it again as part of, uh, of Romania. So there were a few years again where they were not under Soviet rule. And also after World War II, Stalin decided that maybe it wasn't such a good idea to persecute the church as a head because when the Nazis initially started to invade, people were greeting them as liberators. If you ever watched the documentary, by the way, World at War, which is an excellent documentary, uh, but there's a scene where they show the Nazis being greeted as liberators and they say, well, they mistook the Nazis as their own troops. No, they did not. <laughs> no, they did not. They, they greeted them as liberators. Uh, but the Nazis were not smart enough to treat the Soviet citizens very well, and the Soviets wised up that maybe they ought to not continue to persecute the church. And so by the end of World War II, churches were reopening and things were different. So Moldova was spared a lot of the worst of that. So every village has a church, and some, church, some villages have more than one. And these churches are not recent constructed buildings. Most of these, that I, you know, you'll see the date somewhere on the outside, and usually it was 19th century was when the ones that I saw happened to have been built. And uh, so they were able to maintain a religious life that wasn't to the same level in most of the Soviet Union. They have a strong sense of honor, manners, and hospitality. And what struck me was when I would stay in somebody's house, they didn't just put us up in a guest room and treat us nicely, they would put us in their room. Because in Moldovan culture, you don't have a guest room, you have the best room that you are in most of the time, but when you have a guest, you move into another room and that person stays in your room. And they, they felt this as such a strong obligation that was almost an insult to them to not accept it. And we visit a monastery or convent in Moldova that was near the village that we were in. And uh, we positively were kidnapped by the, the nuns. They refused to let us go until we went and, and had a bite to eat. We were supposed to go to dinner at one of uh, Elena, the Moldovan woman from my parish, or one of her uncle's house. And it was like three o'clock in the afternoon by this time. So it's not that far from dinner time. Oh, you just have a couple bites to eat. And we got in there and it was like a nine course meal with dessert. And, uh, and so it, it was just really amazing hospitality. As a matter of fact, we, we, were, we went off to this uh, spring, which is a miraculous spring, and the nun had told us where to go, but she came back to make sure that we just didn't leave. So that's how strongly they take hospitality. And their life is really centered on the, the faith and the church. In the middle of this village, the village was Salkutsa. Um, there's a church, which I got to serve in on a couple of occasions. And... Uh, when, when there was a service, the bells would ring, and most people don't have cars in that village, so you would see people walking to the church. And uh, even if you weren't going to church, you would hear the bells ringing and you would know, okay, there's time, they're doing a service now. Um, in that village, the, the older priest, who's now retired but still hears confession, is the priest that baptized Elena. He was a signer of the Moldovan Declaration of Independence. And, uh, and he was given a lot of grief by the KGB, but I'm told that they feared his mashka, so they only, they only went so far with, with him because she was, she was fearless. And, uh, but they have four sons, all of them are priests, two of which serve this parish still, and the older brother is the rector and the younger brother is an assistant, and they both are school teachers. So when Elena was going to school, Father Nikolai was one of her teachers. So you have a very different lifestyle when you grow up in a village like that. Most of the people in this village, one thing you find when you get out of the cities, everybody has a garden in their yard. Their, their, their entire yard is one big yard, garden. And then many of these people have tracts of land that they, that they own. And so one of the tracts of land that Elena's father has is a, is, is a, is a vineyard. And he makes his own wine. And when, when, he would put wine on the table. He was putting wine that he had grown himself, that he had made into wine himself. And you could see a pride on his face 
when he put that on the table. And he certainly enjoyed hearing people tell him how good it was. And it was. It was Moldovan wine is some of the best wine in the world. And it's almost black. It's so dark. And their soil is very rich. It's a lot like most of the soil in Ukraine. They say that you can, you can throw an old shoe in the soil and then later on something will sprout up. You know, that's how rich the soil is. And, uh, and their life ties in their faith with the, the seasons. Offhandedly, we, we arrived there right before uh, St. Pantelemon's Day on the old calendar, and it was warm, but compared to Houston at that time of the year, it was cool. Uh, and uh, so Elena made the observation, well, after St. Pantelemon's Day is when it starts to get cool. And I thought about that comment. Well, that only comes from someone who grew up being connected to the seasons and the life of the church that you would, and I'm sure this is not probably her original saying. She probably grew up hearing this. St. Pantelemon's Day is when the weather starts to turn for the cooler. Um, what I saw there were people who had strong families. And the, I was asked to give a talk. Uh, the, the Sunday that I was there was the Sunday of the beginning of the Dormition Fast, the procession of the cross. And so, uh, uh, I, I was at that village church, and at the end of the liturgy, the priest asked me to say a few words, and he translated for me, and I talked about what I had seen. But what I also said, you, you need to realize what a treasure you have and hang on to it as tight as you can, because unfortunately, there's a lot of things going on right now that would like to do to Moldova, the same thing that's happened to most of the Western world, which is to turn it into a rootless society where everybody's working for a paycheck, and they lose this connection to their, fam their families, they lose this connection to the land, and, uh, and they start becoming mentally ill like the people in America, because I didn't see mentally ill people in Moldova. I'm not, don't think that everybody in Moldova is a saint. I heard people gossiping and picking at other people and complaining, but they were complaining about people that they loved and, and people who were family members, and everybody knows everybody. When we'd be driving through the village, Elena would see a group of kids and say, oh, well, that's, uh, that's my cousin so-and-so, you know, one of the kids that was playing with those other kids. To live in a village like that is, a, is something a little bit like what I remember as a kid. I remember as a kid being free to roam the neighborhood. At the, like the age of five and six, I would go hiking up Blue Mountain. I was, this is Southern California. Uh, my, my father's family moved to California because of the Dust Bowl, and they did the, the work that Americans won't do. They were picking vegetables. Uh, in Southern California, so that's how I wound up out there. Uh, but, uh, but I used to go hiking up Blue Mountain with kids that were no older than me, and I think today people would be calling 911 if they saw a group of kids walking down the street without an adult in sight. But nobody batted an eye because everybody knew everybody. And, and, uh, and, and in a society where everybody knows everybody, you don't have to worry about your kids going out, whereas now we have helicopter parents that are afraid to let their kids out the door without watching over them like a hawk. And that's a less healthy society. So what can we do to try to regain some of these things? One thing is we need to build strong families ourselves. And I think we also need to establish a sense of rootedness in, in our own families. Uh, Americans move all over the place for work, school, and you know, my, I have two brothers that are still living, and they, they, I'm the only one that stayed in Houston. All, all, all of them, that's where we, where we grew up, although it's not where I was born. Um, one's in Indiana, well, yeah, one's in Ohio, and one's in West Virginia now. He was in Indiana before. Uh, and so we're so scattered that my, my kids didn't really get to know their kids, whereas the Moldovan people, they all know their cousins. They all know their, 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 their grandparents. They all know their nieces and nephews. They have these very strong connections. We need to rebuild that. And one thing we should know, I mean, obviously our ancestors would never came to America if everybody stayed put forever. But when our ancestors moved, unlike what you often think about when you think about pioneers, they moved with their entire family and extended family in many cases and also with families that were friends of their families, because they knew that if you're out there in the middle of nowhere and you're trying to carve out a living from the wilderness, you, you don't want to be by yourself. You want to have people that are going to be, that you can count on, people that will help you. And um, we also need to reestablish a sense of honor and a sense of manners. I go walking almost every morning in my neighborhood and um, 
you know, it's, it's a suburban area, Spring, Texas. And every day during the school year, I walk past bus stops and I will say hello invariably and, and greet all the kids as I pass. And only gradually have some of them started to answer me at all. And I, I can't even imagine that because, you know, I grew up in the same country, <laughs> at least ostensibly. And, uh, and it never would have occurred to me to have an adult say hello and me to not say anything back. But that's the way kids are being brought up today. And I think the only way that we can make any dent in that is to consciously continue to be courteous to people, even when they're not courteous back, and just and to re-implement some old-fashioned manners, and also practice and, and value hosp hospitality. And of course, our life should be centered in the church, that should go without saying, but I also think that we need to, to the extent possible, reconnect with the soil, even if that just means having a garden in your backyard. My wife has a garden in the backyard, and generally I enjoy the garden by watching her work in it. Uh, you know, but but she, she does ask for my help occasionally. But my wife grew up in rural China bef before, before she went to Hong Kong, I think at the age of uh, six, or maybe it was nine, I can't remember. But uh, so she actually lived in a rural area and I think that she has a little bit of a love for that beyond what the average American has because of that. I'm, I'm one generation removed from the farm. I didn't grow up on a farm, but I, in, when I was a kid though, we had relatives that had farms and I would go visit them. So I had some idea what farm life was like. Whereas the further you get away from having a connection with that, the, the, the less connections you have with the land. And, you know, St. John Christum talked about the need for people to get out in, in nature. Pilgrimages were one way that you, you can do that. But living in a city is not natural. The first city we read about in the Bible was established by Cain and Cain was not the good guy in the story. Uh, the, we were really made for a rural life. We were created to tend a garden. And, and I think that to the extent that it's possible, we need to try to reconnect with that, even if it's in small ways. But certainly, if you're able to do it in a bigger way by moving into an area where you can actually have enough land to do things like raise chickens, maybe goats or pigs or something like that, we should try to do that. Because a kid who grows up with farm animals is gonna have enough sense to know that there's men and they're women. They're not, you know, 57 <laughs> genders. Um, and you know, my, I have two granddaughters, one of whom has a birthday today, and I didn't, when I, we scheduled this conference, I didn't think about that, and I really regret it because they're doing the birthday party right now. But, but my son-in-law, he takes her out regularly to what they call the land, and because and, you know, he, he grew up out in uh, Columbus, Texas, and, and Kerrville, they have a family farm out there too, so he'll go out there and they get to see it. And so she gets to see farm animals. And, uh, when she was real little, she spoke more Cantonese than English. So when she, she, would, she, would, she would call out to the rooster, Goong Gai, Goong Gai, call out to the rooster. And, and that means rooster in, in Cantonese. Um, but uh, but she, she loves it when she goes out there. And, that, and so if you have any family that still have these kinds of connections, you need to do that. But there, there are also things we could talk about on a government level. We don't have time for that. I need to wrap things up. But... Um, while we should try to do what we can to maybe get our government to stop incentivizing corporations and, and, and uh, making it hard to be a family farmer. Um, uh, my other son-in-law, Ben, was just telling me last night, John Deere Tractor now put sensors in their tractors so that you cannot repair your own tractor. And, and, and if you do, they will sue the pants off you and take everything you have. And, and if you just try to disable the sensor, they'll find out about it because it's got a Wi-Fi connection. And, and uh, we ought to have politicians that write laws to not make that possible. But instead, we have John Deere Tractor probably writing the laws and getting the people that they're giving the money to to, to pass those kinds of laws. So there's, there's things that we can do to change things to make it easier for people to live in a rural situation. Now, because of remote working, some people are able to live in a rural area and have a job that would be a desk job in the past. So that's one good thing that you could say came out of the lockdowns. But uh, the, we don't have that much control over the big picture, but we do have control over ourselves. We have control over our families. So we can do what we can do. And if we start trying to live out this kind of a traditional way of living, other people are gonna see the differences and they're gonna be attracted to that because nobody wants to live in a society of lunatics. People wanna live in a society of sane people that are well-rounded 
And if you're a Christian, you want to live in a society where people have a sense of morality and they love God. And, uh, and that's a much better place to raise kids. So that's what we need to work on and, and try to make happen as best as we can on our own small scale level. Thank you. Thank you.